Uh, good afternoon, everyone. You can be seated. We're getting ready to start. I'm Grace Mary Brady, president of the Bayside History Museum, and the event today is sponsored by the Bayside History Museum and our Calvert Libraries. Um, could I have my board members and volunteers stand for the Bayside History Museum, please? We have Diane, Hillary, Patsy, Gloria, Lucy, Lucy. I'd like to acknowledge the current director of the Calvert Marine Museum, Mr. Alves. And of course, we wouldn't exist if it weren't for our wonderful mayor of North Beach. Mark Frazier, stand up and take a bow. I don't think Ralph needs a lot of an introduction. Everyone knows him. He was the former director of the Calvert Marine Museum. We finally call him the traveling man. So without further ado, we really appreciate you coming today and sharing your trips to Antarctica with us. Thank you. Ralph Eshel. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Can you, everyone here all right? Yes. All right, great. How many of you have ever been to Antarctica? One, two, three, four, five people. That's not bad, because not too many people ever get down to that continent. So five people out of maybe, I don't know, what do we have here, 60, 70 people? That's, that's actually a high percentage, because nationwide it would be much fewer people that have ever been to Antarctica. How many people want to go to Antarctica? <laughs> How many of you are just here because, you know, it's a Sunday afternoon, you don't have anything better to do? Oh, okay. All right. Honest people, I like that. <laughs> When I graduated, that's how I call it, from the Calvert Marine Museum, way back in 1990, I had always had this desire to go to Terra del Fuego. I don't know why, I just always had that drive to do it. And the only way that I knew to get there without having to pay my own expenses was to work in an expedition company. And typically all the companies that went to Terra del Fuego would also go to Antarctica. And so Antarctica was kind of like a secondary priority for me. But I started going down in 1991, and since then I've gone down every year except for two. One, because I had some other business that I had to take care of, and in a second year, the ship that I was on never made it because of a large storm. And I've already signed up to go again next year. So if you add up all the number of times that I've been down there, I actually lost count after 50, but I'm, I think it's somewhere between about 55 and 60. And several years ago, I tried to estimate how many years of my life have I spent in Antarctica. And one of the interesting things that came out of that, and you're going to see as we get into this introduction here, that to get to Antarctica, you almost have to go by ship. It's possible to go by airplane, but that's very, very expensive. But it's about a two-day journey from the nearest port where you can fly into to get to the Antarctic Peninsula. So that's two days across what's known as some of the worst waters in the world. Uh, many of you probably have heard about that particular channel that they have down there. And then it's also two days to get back. So for every trip that I go down, I've spent four days of my life in that particular strait. And if you add up all the number of trips, over seven months of my life have been spent in that strait going back and forth between Antarctica. <clears throat> it, and it's pretty interesting when you think about it that way. So why do I go? Well, I think by the time we get done with this presentation, you'll understand. It's a very, very interesting place. It's full of wildlife, and it's also full of history. And what may surprise you is that almost every year when I'm down there, and we get communications where we have a little daily one-page kind of a newspaper, we call it, that tells us about all the highlights of what's going on in the rest of the world. And there's, on the bottom part, they have the weather forecast for maybe, let's say, 20 cities in the world. And usually Washington, D.C. or New York City is included in that. And in almost every instance, when I'm in the Antarctic, it's warmer there than it is in Washington, D.C. or in New York City. 
and that surprises a lot of people, but there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, you don't go to Antarctica during the Antarctic winter. You go in the summer. So that means we're getting weather reports from the northern hemisphere, which is in the winter. The other thing you have to keep in mind, and I'll show you a map a little bit later, is that when you go to Antarctica, you want to go to the easiest place to get to, which means the place that's going to be furthest to the north, which because we're talking about the southern hemisphere, right? So the north is going to be warmer than the south where it's going to be colder. So you want to go to that shortest passage, and because of that, you're in the peninsula. And the peninsula is surrounded by ocean, so you have a maritime climate as opposed to a continental climate. So when you hear all the reports about how cold it is and how windy and all that kind of stuff, that's true for the continent. But for where 99.9% .9 of the visitors go, you're in the peninsula. And locally it's referred to as the banana belt. Because it's much, much warmer, it's not anywhere near as windy, and not as hostile as getting down to the continent itself. And that's where we go. And you might say, well, <clears throat> gosh, that doesn't sound that exciting. But you know the animals? They're pretty smart. The animals that live in Antarctica, they want to be in the best places too. So if you want to see a lot of wildlife, you want to go to the places that we go to. And that's the peninsula. So that's why we go there. So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> you can see from the, uh, the title here, we're talking about the Great White Continent and glaciers, penguins, and icebergs. Initially, while you're still fresh on a Sunday afternoon, I'm going to give you a little bit of information, but most of this lecture is going to be just entertainment. It's going to be pretty pictures of what it's like to be in Antarctica. So, I really love this quote. This is by Durant, who wrote a, a book that's called This is Antarctica, and I'll read it to you. Imagine a place as big as the United States and Europe combined. Sunnier than California, yet colder than the freezing compartment of your refrigerator. Drier than Arabia and higher than mountainous Switzerland. Emptier than the Sahara. It's Antarctica, the strange but beautiful continent at the bottom of the earth. Some of the things that may surprise you. It's the fifth largest continent consisting of over 5 million square miles and about 14,000 miles of coastline. That may sound like a lot. But you know that the Chesapeake Bay and all of its tributaries has approximately, depending on how you want to count them, between seven and 8,000 miles of shoreline? So Antarctica, even though it's much bigger, the shoreline doesn't have a lot of these tributaries and embayments and whatnot. And so even though it's the fifth largest continent, it only has about 14,000 miles of sea line. With an average elevation of 6,000 feet, Antarctica has the highest average elevation of any continent. And think about when people like Scott and Amundsen attempted to go to the South Pole, and no one had ever been there before. They had no idea that they're going to be dealing with elevations that could be anywhere from eight to 10,000 feet. So not only are they struggling against severe cold and wind, they're dealing with elevation. That's like you trying to spend months in the high mountains, let's say of the, the Rocky Mountains or the Himalayas, trying to get from one place to another. So this was a surprising thing that made it even more difficult to explore the interior of the Antarctic continent. With an average of five to six inches of precipitation a year, and only two to three inches at the South Pole, Antarctica is the driest continent. Technically, Antarctica is a desert. When we think of deserts, we tend to think of sand dunes like the Sahara. But that's not the definition of a desert. The definition is based on the amount of moisture that is there. And Antarctica, because it's so cold, has very little moisture. Have you ever heard that saying that it's too cold to snow? Mm -hmm. What they mean by that is that if you have extremely cold temperatures, there's no moisture in that air. So you don't get a whole lot of snow. Why do we get a lot of snow here? Because we're close enough to where we're getting that moisture, that maritime environment that's providing the moisture to any cold fronts that come down. So that's why we get a lot of snow here, particularly the last couple of years that's happened. You don't get that in Antarctica. 
two to three inches of snow at the South Pole. We get more snow here in Calvert County than you get at the South Pole. And most of what we refer to as snow is not really snow. It's any little pieces of moisture that are in that atmosphere that freezes and it very slowly comes down in little tiny crystals of frozen water. Little tiny ice particles and they build up over time. The big reason that Antarctica has so much snow and ice is that hardly any of it ever melts because it's so cold. Here, fortunately, all of our snow melts. In Antarctica, that's not the case. The coldest continent, with average of minus 40 to minus 90 degrees Fahrenheit in winter, and plus 5 to minus 31 degrees Fahrenheit in summer. That's the average. What's the average temperature in the Panana Belt, where we go? Somewhere in the low 20s to the high 30s. So when I say that it's colder here in New York or in Washington, D.C., that's why. Because it's not unusual for us to have temperatures that are below the temperatures that we're getting in the banana belt. And then finally, if you want to go to the windiest continent on Earth, you want to go to Antarctica. And I have been there when the winds are so severe on many, many occasions that we couldn't even get off the ship. It's just too dangerous. You can't launch zodiacs, you can't be out in the open water trying to get to shore when you have winds that are in excess of 45 miles per hour. And then finally, where's the cleanest air in the world? It's in Antarctica. And the reason for that is that because Antarctica is completely surrounded by water, you have a polar circulation of wind that goes around that continent, which essentially isolates the atmosphere in Antarctica from the rest of the world. And because there's no industry down there, and because very few people live there, researchers and support staff that are there year-round, you don't have a lot of pollution. Most of the pollution is coming from expedition ships. And right now, on average, there's about 30 to 32 expedition ships going down to Antarctica every year. <clears throat> when I started in 1991, there were three expedition ships. So it's becoming much more increasingly common now for people to go down there than it ever was in the past. You guys have probably seen all kinds of cartoons. I don't know if you can see these very well, but the one on the left, you have a polar bear talking to a penguin, and it says, well, one of us is in the wrong cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> and what they mean by that, of course, is that so many people who don't understand what Antarctica is versus what the Arctic is get these things confused. And I've talked to people, and I said, yeah, I'm heading down to Antarctica, and they'll say, oh, we'll take a picture of a polar bear for me. And of course, polar bears do not exist in Antarctica, nor do penguins exist in the Arctic. So that's what that's all about. And I don't know if you can read the one here on the right, but this is the Arctic tern. The Arctic tern is a bird that migrates from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back every year. It's the longest migration of any bird in the world. So can you imagine doing that? <clears throat> and so here's a bunch of Antarctic terns that are talking to penguins and it's referring to what they saw when they were in the Arctic, these polar bears. And you can see the reaction of the penguins. And then here's the same Arctic terns now talking about what penguins look like in the Antarctica and the bears are just laughing. But these are just cartoons to help us to understand that there's a big, big difference between these two places. And if it'll come up, there's another cartoon here. There we go. And here we have penguins at the zoo next to the polar bears, and it says, I'm sorry, we're just poles apart. And in fact, they truly are poles apart. This is the Arctic. I think you can make out Greenland. There's uh, North America. And here's Antarctica. They're exactly the opposite. Not only in their position, but, for example, the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by land, and Antarctica is a continent surrounded by ocean. How more different can you be? And in the Arctic, there's approximately 144,000 native people that live within the Arctic Circle. 
So like Laplanders, the Inuit, some people might refer to them as Eskimos, they live within the Arctic Circle. But in Antarctica, there are no native peoples, not one. The only people that are there are scientists and the support staff in the wintertime. And in the summertime, you do have expedition ships that will come in with maybe a hundred, a couple of hundred people that might go ashore at one time. And then, as we've already talked about, the Arctic is famous for its polar bears, walrus, and blood-sucking insects, mosquitoes. If you've ever been there, you've experienced that. Whereas in Antarctica, it's famous for its penguins. They truly are poles apart. And this is just a map. You can see that you've got a big area that's referred to as East Antarctica, which is separated from West Antarctica by the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. And this is the peninsula. So when I talk about the Antarctic Peninsula surrounded by ocean, I think you can begin to understand why I talk about this maritime environment. And so the maritime environment here is very different from the continental environment that you would get down there. That's why we have these extremes and temperatures and amount of snow, wind, and all these other kinds of things as well. This is a satellite image, and from it you get the impression that almost all of that continent is covered in ice. And you know why. Because the moisture that falls is frozen and it hardly ever melts. One of the reasons that we tend to also do most of our expedition cruising out and through here is that there are portions of the shoreline that are ice-free where you can get ashore and you don't have to worry about stepping on ice and snow. <coughs> you don't really have that in almost any other place in Antarctica with one exception down and through here which is known as the Dry Valleys and I'm not going to go into that but if someone wants to ask the question it's an area that's about 30 by 100 miles it gets very little precipitation and because of that, it's pretty much like a desert that you would expect to see uh, somewhere else in the world. 80, I'm sorry, 98% of the world's fresh water is locked up in ice. And as you can well imagine, most of that's going to be in Antarctica. The largest ice cap, or ice sheet, if you want to call it that, in the world is Antarctica. Anybody know what the second largest one is? I heard someone say it. It's Greenland. Anybody know what the third one is? It's in Europe. It's not what we think of as Europe, but it's Iceland. Maybe appropriately named Iceland. <laughs> Only 1% of the fresh water is readily usable as surface water, such as streams and lakes and whatnot. Only 1% of all the water in our world. And much of that is like in the Great Lakes. And Antarctica ice caps contain about 68% of all the world's fresh water. So if we have a drought, all we need to do is go up to Antarctica, right? <laughs> and then figure out how, it's going to, how do you get that ice, let's say, to uh, Southern California, where they're having droughts right now. And then if the Antarctic ice caps melted, sea level is estimated to rise about 200 feet. What would that mean for Calvert County? <laughs> There's no place in Florida, there's no place in Calvert County that's over 200 feet above sea level. We would be underwater. But fortunately, we don't have to worry about that in our lifetime. If we went to the center of the continent near the South Pole, what would it look like? Not very interesting, is it? Pretty flat. You can see where the wind is called these little ridges as it's blown across the the top of the ice cap breaking through there. And this is the typical experience of some of the scientists that are going out exploring the ice cap. Other places you have glaciers that are moving off the top of the ice cap down through the mountains. And when you think of glaciers, if you've been to Glacier National Park or if you've been to Alaska, those things are little tiny glaciers compared to the glaciers that you have in Antarctica. For example, this is the Beardmore Glacier right here. Beardmore Glacier is over 300 miles long and over 30 miles wide. There's no glacier like that anywhere else in the world that has this kind of size. And in Antarctica, there's hundreds of glaciers like that. And then you also have these mountains. 
Imagine being a geologist. How difficult is it to get in and do the geology of these places? Because they're covered in ice and in snow. It's not very easy to do. And then this is another image that shows you elevation. So the darker the pink is the higher the elevation. Remember the average elevation of Antarctica is over 6,000 feet. And it goes up to over 12,000 feet in the Transantic Mountains down and through here. And then when you get into the greens, those are the lowest elevations. So what I'm trying to impress upon you is that East Antarctica is this huge ice cap. And the ice is so thick there that in places it's almost three miles thick. Three miles in thickness of ice in the East Antarctic ice cap. The West Antarctic ice cap is not as large and not as high, but nevertheless is a significant amount of frozen seawater, or I should say fresh water. And this is just an image showing you what the continent looks like with the ice, and if all of that ice melted, that's what it would look like there. And sea level would be around 200 feet higher. The other thing that's important for everybody to understand is that when you have this great amount of ice and you have new snow that's being deposited every year, even though it might only be three to six inches, all of that ice survives from year to year. It accumulates, and as more and more ice accumulates, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper, and ice begins to flow like a plastic. The amount of pressure and due to gravity, the ice begins to flow outward and it seeks to go to the ocean through the lowest possible channels that it can find. And those would be the valleys in between the mountains. And so all of these lines that you see here represent the direction of flow in which ice is moving off of the ice cap every year. And so if you want to know why we have icebergs, it's because of the very fact that all of that ice is very slowly moving downward like very thick molasses on your pancakes that you might have had this morning. And then when it gets down into the ocean, it calves off and it forms glaciers, which then become icebergs. And the largest amount of icebergs in the world are being calved from Antarctica. The second largest number of icebergs in the world are being calved from Greenland. So these are the directions in which the movement of all of this ice is going. And then here's a, a real neat example of this. You probably know that the Amundsen-Scott Research Station, which is operated by the United States government through the National Science Foundation, is located at the geographic South Pole. Or at least when they built it, it was located at the geographic South Pole. But because the ice cap is moving, the research station has now moved off of what was the geographic South Pole. And so every year they have a ceremony where they put up a marker where that geographic South Pole is located. And from one year to the next, it's generally about 30 feet difference. That's how much it moves in a typical year. And so this might be 2014. That might be 2013. That might be 2012, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Interestingly enough, if you look at this little cartoon on the left, which you may or not be able to, to read, um, when Amundsen made it to the South Geographic Pole, which was the first human to ever be able to do that, and that happened in 1911, that position that he was at in 1911 is now over 3,000 feet from where it was at that time. That's how much it's moved. So that means that that station, that research station, which costs millions of dollars to build and millions of dollars to maintain, eventually is going to have to be moved back if you want to continue to have your research all being done at the geographic south pole. There's political reasons also to have a position there that I won't get into at this point unless someone wants to ask a question about it. What are some of the things that you can see if you go there? Are you surprised to see that amount of green? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what the heck is that? It's snow algae. If you're near a penguin colony where the penguins are pooping, 
and providing wonderful nutrients, you typically will get things like snow algae. And as you know, a lot of algae tends to be green. So this is green snow algae. This is red snow algae. You also know that there's red algae as well as green algae. And when you get them together, you have what we call Christmas algae. <laughs> and we call it Christmas snow. And this is mainly due to the poop, the nutrients from the penguins that are providing the minerals and whatnot for this algae to survive in these snows. And it's actually very beautiful. What is the largest permanent inhabitant of the Antarctic continent? And you're looking at it right there. It's an insect. All of the other animals, I'm not, if you're talking about a penguin, you're talking about a seal, a whale, whatever it is, they are not permanent inhabitants of the continent. Because most of them in the wintertime, they have to get out to the edge of the ice in order to be able to feed. If you're feeding on krill, what good is it for you to be landlocked? You're not going to do very well in getting food, are you? But the largest permanent resident of Antarctica is what is known as a springtail. And it's a little tiny insect, and you can see thousands of them right here in this particular image. And then this is a little bit of a detail of what they look like. So that's the largest permanent resident of Antarctica. What size are they? A gnat or a snail? Yeah, it's about an eighth of an inch. So it's very, very small. And actually they're hard to see unless they're up against the snow because they tend to be black. But most of the time when I see them, it's in melting ice water. And that's where they'll feed on little uh, nutrients and whatnot that are in the water. So they're semi-aquatic. And they're very difficult to see other than when they're on snow. This may surprise you, but that's grass. You can actually have a green grass that will grow in some of the parts of Antarctica, for the most part on the peninsula, because it's warmer in the peninsula. And then in the same image, you might be able to make out some lichens. And then you probably can't see this very well, but that's another type of algae. So we have three different types of plants right there in that one image. That is the forest of Antarctica. Because that's as big as any of these plants are going to get, that you're seeing right there. You're not going to have any shrubs. You're not going to have any trees. And this is a rock, one of my favorite rocks. We tend to go to this place all the time. It's called Brown Bluff. And this has been sculpted by the wind, where the wind has picked up grains off of beaches and has literally sculpted this rock into this beautiful, almost like a half-shell effect. But the reason I'm showing it to you is that right there. And here's a detail of it. That's like it. And if you look at the different colors, you've got orange, you've got yellow, you've got kind of a darker yellow, you've got white, and you've got black. Each one of those is a different species of lichen. So this is life in Antarctica. This is amazing life in Antarctica. And look how colorful it is. You tend to think of Antarctica as being black and white. It depends on where you go and where you look. And if you get into the water, to dive in Antarctica is pretty amazing because most of the sea life there is very, very large. You, ch you tend to have gigantism in Antarctica. So, for example, the starfish tend to be larger than the typical starfish that you might find in warmer waters. Here is a sea urchin. Here's a jellyfish. I don't have anything there for scale, but that's about two and a half feet in diameter. And you'll get bigger ones than that. That's called the lion mane. Here's krill. This is the base of life for most of the, the sea <coughs> animals that live in Antarctica, such as the seals and the whales. And even many of the penguins will eat krill. And you can see the krill in the water. Uh, it's amazing. And this is a copepod. You have many different types of insect-like, crustacean-like animals um, that live there. And isn't this an eye that just, don't you want to just fall in love with this animal? <laughs> and isn't that beautiful? I'm being kind of facetious. Anybody want to guess what this animal is? 
seal. It's an elephant seal. Probably the, the ugliest of any of the animals that live in Antarctica. But this is a bunch of elephant seals that are huddled together. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about the oxygen. You said the air is in fresh air. Mm -hmm. Does oxygen come from other parts of the world? Yeah, oxygen, of course, is just one of the, the parts of the makeup of the atmosphere. But what I was trying to get across is that when we have a lot of pollutants, like a few from here drive into Washington, D.C. on a summer day, as you get closer to the city, you can actually see the haze, the pollution. And that's because of so much uh, automobile activity and everything else that we do in burning uh, petrol chemicals and that type of thing. And in Antarctica, it's very, very limited. And most of the pollutants from the rest of the world come up against this barrier, what is known as the polar circum uh, winds that go all the way around the continent. And that's because it's surrounded by water. So that's why you have some of the most people say the cleanest airs in the world are so the Antarctica. The trees. This is just one of these guys. They have horrible breath. You might imagine. <laughs> and I don't want to make this sound too gross, but these are animals that at night swim and feed at great depths, and that's why they have a large eye so that they can see at night to capture their prey. In the daytime, essentially what they do is they come in and they just lay amongst themselves and they urinate and they defecate upon themselves and there's this big pool of this horrible stench and they live in that and then when they get ready to go out and feed because it's starting to get dark they get back in the water and they're all cleaned up again and they go and they do their feeding and they come back to the same place that they were before and these are known as uh, wallows elephant seal wallows and you can smell an elephant seal wallow long before you ever get there. And then you have males that are typically doing their territorial fighting uh, for the female. And then we talked about the wallows. They also like to get in the mud. And I'm using that word mud in a polite sense because most of it is actually fecal material. And so this is an example of a young elephant seal puff that's been in one of these wallows, completely covered in essentially feces, and happy as can be. <laughs> and there he is looking back at you. And I'm sure its mother loves it very, very dear. But that's a typical wallow right there. And then we also have more beautiful seals. These are called the crab eaters. And a crab eater, despite its name, does not eat crabs. It eats krill which is similar to a crab. And the most common seal in the world is the crab eater seal. And depending on where you are, you can sometimes see a solitary seal, or you might see hundreds of them swimming around in the water together. So this is an example of many of them up on, a, on an iceberg. And then this is a Weddell seal. It lo looks similar, but it's actually kind of fatter. And it's also a beautiful seal. A lighter color with kind of a darker pattern on its back and a lighter color on its bottom. And then you also get these beautiful colorations. This is a Weddell seal, W-E-D-D-E-L-L, -L, named after one of the explorers that first identified these animals. They're very cute. It's really my favorite seal. And you can see the umbilical. That's the belly button, and these are the teats. That's a female, and that's the uh, genital slit. So that's how you can tell the sex, because the genitals are internal on these animals, as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. And this is the fur seal. This is a, probably the most aggressive animal that you have in Antarctica. This is the animal that people ordinarily are told to stay five meters away from any animal. In this instance, you're told to stay 15 meters away. And for those of you that have been there, you know this is almost impossible to do because there's so many of these things you can't move through and stay 15 meters away. But they're very aggressive. They have a high hormonal rate. Where the males just go crazy. Uh, they're fighting each other all the time. But they're wonderful animals. Uh, they look very cute. I mean, you just want to go up and hug one of them. But I can tell you from personal experience, that they will bite because I have been bitten. Oh. And 
the re reason they're called fur seals is that these animals were hunted, uh, and their fur was used to make top hats, like the top of a, a hat that Abraham Lincoln would have worn, would have been made from the fur of a fur seal. And there's a little pup, and you might find this interesting because that's chewing on an antler. Anybody recognize that antler? That's a reindeer antler. And reindeers are not native to Antarctica. This is from a sub-Antarctic island called South Georgia, where the Norwegian whalers brought in reindeer so that they could have meat on the hoof. And now all of those reindeer have been killed off because they were affecting the environment. But here we still have an antler with a young pup that's chewing on it. And they're really cute guys. I love these guys. It's just a shame that they grow up. <laughs> This is a male, you can see it's shaking. Um, and all of what this white stuff you see out here are actually the feathers that have been molted off of a penguin. When a penguin molts, they go through what's known as a catastrophic molt. Because you want to get rid of all of your feathers as quickly as possible to get your new coat. And you can't go back in the water until you have your new coat. Because otherwise, it's too cold. So they go through this stratigraph. That's not right. This very quick molt, and that's why the water and whatnot will be completely full of these feathers. And it will last how long? The molt depends on the species and really how old the animal is, but it can be anywhere from four to five days to a couple of weeks. And they're very irritable because they're very itchy and they can't go in the water, they're hungry. So it's not a fun time for a penguin. I don't know if you recognize this seal, but this is the leopard seal. So this is kind of like the equivalent of the, uh, the lion. Africa. This is the guy that's feeding on everybody else that's below him. And they're actually, I think, beautiful animals, but you can see the size of their mouth. Compared to their head, they have an unusually large mouth. And that's for them to be able to grasp prey and to hold on to that prey. And to me, they're very much like cats. You know how a cat will play with a mouse? Well, these guys will play with their prey before they eat it. So they'll grab a penguin in the water, flip it up in the air, catch it, and the poor penguin is suffering and whatnot. But that's, that's life in nature. <clears throat> but isn't that kind of reptilian almost? I mean, it's really an amazing animal. And they're very curious. They'll come right up to a zodiac. Uh, at one of the research uh, stations in Antarctica, they had to put um, extra uh, protection on the end of the zodiacs because these guys would come up and try to gnaw on it and a zodiac is made out of rubber so it's not a good thing to have these guys gnawing on the, the rubber ends of your zodiac that's frozen uh, mucus out of the snout probably had a cold what do you think these bones are right here a whale and there's a moratorium on whaling in antarctica now there is still pirate whaling, that's illegal whaling vessels that come into Antarctic waters and illegally take whales. But back in the 30s and right on up to the late 60s, whaling was a big deal in Antarctica. And unfortunately, in the early years, all they did was take the blubber. And then they would let everything else go. And so you would have this floating carcass of a whale that would wash up on the beach, and then all of these bones would be found all along the beaches. And in the background, you can make out a little wooden boat. That's what's known as a water boat, where the whalers would go out and collect fresh water that you needed to operate your steam engines on board your vessels and whatnot. And then this is the fluke of a humpback whale. This is the most common whale that you have in Antarctica today. And this is just a series showing you this would like be on board a vessel or being on board a zodiac where you can see this kind of thing very close to you. If you want to go whale watching in Antarctica, is the best place to go. How wide is it? That's, uh, that whale's probably about 40 feet long, and that's probably about five to six feet right there, something like that. And then here's another humpback where it's just come up, and it's exhaled to blow out the water that's trapped in the, the narrow opening, just like when you like do a breaststroke when you're swimming in a pool. You take that gulp of water, and when you come up, you blow out under water until you come up to the surface, take another gulp and go in. That's what these guys are doing, so they don't take any water in when they take in their air. 
And then here's one of their flippers. Uh, humpbacks have tremendously long flippers, and they're white so that you can see them under the water. And they're also the acrobats of the world world, of the whale world. Uh, they're wonderful animals to watch because they do sky hopping, they reach out of the water, they do all kinds of wonderful things. Beautiful to see. This is an example of several whales that are swimming in a circle, and they're letting out water, they'll swim down, and they'll, I'm sorry, they let out air, and they form what's known as a, a bubble ring. And what that does is it traps the krill in the middle of it, and then they'll all come up in the middle of that ring together and take the krill out of the water column. So that's what you see there. Anybody want to guess what kind of bird that is? It's an albatross. If you want to see albatross, there's no place in the world where there's more albatross than going up through the Drake Passage. And you'll, you can see hundreds of these guys off the fantail of your ship. And what you have to imagine is that from the tip to tip, you're talking about six to seven feet. These are very, very large birds. Not very particularly easy to photograph because they're constantly moving and your ship is moving all at the same time. But that is a wandering albatross, which is the largest albatross in the world. That's another example over here. It's easier to get the backs of them than it is to get the front of them because very rarely are they coming toward you off of the fantail. This is a kelp gall. These are galls that uh, feed on limpets and they actually swallow the whole limpet with the shell intact and then they digest the food and then they regurgitate the shell. And where they have a nest you'll find this big midden of limpet shells all over the place. But a beautiful bird, you can see this one is in its uh, mating uh, display. And here's the chicks. Very beautiful chicks. It seems like babies are always yeah. so wonderful. <laughs> here's a chick of this next bird that I'm going to show you. This is not um, the same guy. This is called the giant petrel. <laughs> is it hard to believe you go from that? <laughs> and this is not natural coloration right there. That's blood because these guys are also scavengers. So if they find an animal that's died in the water, whatever it might be, they go in and tear it apart and fight over every tiny morsel that they can get. And this guy's taking a little bit of a bath. And then when you get the tail coming up like this, this is a threatening mode. In other words, he's telling this guy, that right there is mine, stay away. And then, how do you like this? This is the Antarctic chicken. Um, this is the only bird in Antarctica that doesn't have webbed feet. It has feet just like a normal bird. Interestingly enough, it looks like a chicken, and it's called a sheathed bill. I have to be careful because some ornithologists also call it the SH uh, 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 bird. <laughs> and the reason for that is that it goes around and it eats the poop of other birds. And what it really relishes is any parasites and things that might be in the poop of other birds. So what it would be like to eat one of those, I have no idea. <laughs> but that's a detail of the sheath bill. Kind of interesting eyes, huh? Speaking of eyes, this is the blue-eyed shag, also known as cormorant for those of us in North America. So a cormorant this is what this bird is. In Antarctica and in Europe, we refer to them as a shag. And this is not actually the color of the eye. That's actually the sheath that is around the eye that is blue. It gives it that real nice color. And then the males get this coracle up and through here uh, to make it look more beautiful during the mating season. And then here is a, an adult feeding its young. I don't know if that's a male or a female. Very difficult to tell in birds, except generally by size. But you can see all of these chicks are looking for food that would then be regurgitated by the adult. And you can see two, ch well, three chicks here, very active, and a fourth one down here, trying to get food from that adult. Mm -hmm. And here you can see one has successfully gotten all the way into that portion of that bird. So if you are a mom or a dad, can you imagine what it would be like for you to be coming back with food and then your chick is coming halfway down their throat to get that food as you regurgitate it back up. 
it can't be a very fun thing. They make their nests out of mud, so they build up these little mud nests, which are very unique to Antarctica. There's no other bird that has a mud nest like that. And this is one coming in for a landing. You can see that it's male because of that coracle up and through here. And then we have our first penguin. And any penguin that has an orange beak is called a gentoo. That's G-E-N-T-O-O, -O, gentoo. And a lot of people like the gentoo. It's not necessarily my favorite, but here are a bunch of gentoos. And they build their nests with stones. So they go around and steal stones from one another to add to their nest. Now, why do they do that? When these adults begin to mate, early in the spring, the Antarctic spring, there's still snow on the ground. So they need to build their nest up so that when that snow melts, they don't get cold water coming into their nest and causing their eggs to die. So that's why they build these nests that are up above where the melt water will be. And that's where they lay their eggs. Pretty smart strategy. The other thing that they'll do is that they tend to go up into a higher area where there'll be less snow. So you can see there's water down there. There's ice still on the water. So these penguins have come all the way up to this area where most of the snow had already melted before they even began to lay their eggs. And this is what it would look like in a typical colony. Um, all of this is essentially feces because these guys are sitting on the nest and they're defecating all around the nest. So every time you walk from one place to another, you're going through everybody else's feces. And remember, that's the nutrient for, for example, the snow algae that I was talking about. How tall is he? I'm sorry? How tall is he? Uh, that adult would be maybe between, let's say, 16 to 20 inches high, something like that. Not particularly large. So here's a chick that's uh, hatched. And you can see it's still very much attached to its, whether that's the mother or the father, I don't know. Both share the duties of taking care of the young. Uh, here you can see one that's taken a rock to add to its nest, while at the same time this is a young chick that's waiting to be fed. So this adult has probably already fed that chick, has nothing more to give to it. So it's now waiting for the other adult, which may be the male or the female that's out fishing. And when it comes back, it'll take over, it'll feed the chick, and then take care of the nest until they just keep rotating out. And here you can see an egg that has not hatched. And there is the brood pouch laid in through there. And here you can even see the brood pouch better. So the idea is that you sit down with that over your egg to keep your egg warm. And here you can see another one with its stiff upper tail. And there's the egg. It's just getting ready to sit down on it. All of these penguins are known as the stiff-tailed penguins. And if you ever go to Antarctica and you look at them, they rest on the hind balls of their feet. And their tail serves as a way for them to rest back on. It gives them enough support that they can rock right back on their tail. And that's how they sit. So they're known as the stiff-tailed family of penguins. And this is, unfortunately, what can happen when you're in the colony. You see what's on the back of that penguin? That's where another penguin pooped on it. It's so dedicated to its nest that it didn't realize another penguin was getting ready to poop. And there it is, right on the back. But that's life in the colony. So this is all poop. And you notice the color of the poop. It's pink. And that's because they're eating krill. So if you eat a lot of krill, your poop's going to be the color of the krill. So this is kind of a clean penguin that's probably just come out of the water because it doesn't have a lot of poop on it yet. But before the day is over, it will. And then these are the trails that they make. So as that snow is melting, they want to have the best way to be able to move between their nest and their feeding area, which is going to be the ocean. And if you look closely at these trails, you can see that it's like a highway. And that's where the leg, the right leg would be here, and the left leg would be there as it goes up and down these particular trails. 
And then hard for us to imagine, but when a penguin comes out of the water, after exerting all of that energy and swimming, it builds up a lot of heat. And so now it's, it wants to ventilate. It wants to cool off. And so when they come ashore, they put their flippers out, and their veins, their blood veins, are very close to the surface, right along the underside of their flipper. And so that's how they tend to cool themselves. So it's not only just for balance when you're walking, but this is a way to cool yourself. So even though you're in Antarctica and you think you want to conserve heat, these guys build up too much heat when they're swimming because their feathers are actually very, very good uh, in, in insulation. And I know some of you are asking, okay, how do they do it? <clears throat> and here you can see, obviously, a male on top of a female. So another way that you can sometimes tell a male from a female is if the female has footprints on its back. <laughs> that's a female. And you're laughing, but that's what scientists do. They're looking for these kinds of ways to determine what the sexes are. And then this is the result. When these eggs finally hatch, you get these cute little chicks. And again, it's orange, so you know this is a Gen 2. There's another example of a Gen 2 that's a little bit larger. You can begin to see some of its permanent feathers are coming in. These are all of its juvenile plumage that you have right there. And then here's two babies that are beginning to get some of its permanent uh, or adult pelage. And this is what it's like when it's wet. The worst thing that can happen to lose your insulatory properties is for it to get too warm and for things to get very, very wet. That's not good for your, for your downy feathers. Just some more examples. Very proud parent with his two chicks, very handsome chicks. This is what the typical scene would be like when you go ashore. You have to imagine what the smell would also be like here. And when you get back in your cabin and you're sniffing around, and you might have, yeah. it's just impregnated into your clothing. It can also be on your boots. If you sit down, the law is that you're not allowed to get within five meters of the penguin. But if you sit down and let the penguin come to you, that's okay. And so these are some kids on a trip who have sit down. And here you can see a penguin that's come right up next to these guys. It's jumped right up on their lap. They're taking pictures. I mean, that's a thrill for anybody to have something like that happen. And then here's an adult again looking down at one chick, and here's an unhatched egg. Now that egg at this point is probably not going to hatch. It's too late. And remember I talked a lot about the pooping? Well, in this case, we're looking at white poop. This is not the pink poop. So the white poop is going to be from eating fish. And so in this case, you've got penguins that are, have pooped in all these different directions that have kind of added this almost beauty, I would say, to the, to the growth that you have there at that particular spot. So this is another species. You notice the difference? Black beak, and you have this ring down here. These are known as the chin straps. The chin strap penguin. One of my favorite. These are like the engineers. These are the guys that tend to climb the highest. And their chicks are very similar. A little bit different color, a little bit lighter. Again, you can see the amount of poop back and forth here. Uh, here's feeding. That white dot right there, that's referred to as the, the egg tooth. It's not really a tooth, but that's what they use to break through the eggshell when they become hatched. Swimming. You know, penguins can't fly, right? Well, in fact, penguins fly in the water. They're absolutely excellent swimmers. And they can swim as well underwater as most birds can fly above the water. And that's how they feed. And here are trumpeting. When the adults come ashore after feeding, they trumpet so that they can hear their chick. And when they can identify that chick, they know they're in the right area. And once one begins to trumpet, it seems like everybody else begins to trumpet. And it's just amazing the sound of all these penguins trumpeting together. So here's a young one that's uh, getting ready to do its uh, catastrophic molt. You can see he's not too happy there. A couple of adults. 
this one look different? Yeah. This is a third species. This is called the Adelie penguin, named after an explorer who missed his wife so much that he named it after his wife, whose name was Adele. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. Somehow he thought they looked like his wife. <laughs> I have no idea. But Adelies are also cool penguins. When you typically see pictures of the black and white butler type penguin, that's the one they're talking about. They're talking about the Adelie. And one of the neat things about Adelies is that they don't want to go in the water by themselves because they're, they're fearful of predators and whatnot. So they kind of wait until more and more get together. And then eventually one will jump in and then a whole bunch of them will jump in together. And that's what you're seeing here. Like this guy saying, oh, I'm not sure I want to go in yet. And there they finally jump in. And then everybody else jumps in. And then they're under the water. And then big splash. And then he comes up to look around. Hey, what's happening? The water dripping off its snout. But they're really great animals. Yeah. Okay. They can swim, I, I've never measured them, but I would say easily they could swim 20 miles per hour. I mean, they just dart around, it's, it's amazing. You have to be fast to be able to get your prey, if you're looking for fish and stuff like that. So anyway, they also toboggan. I don't know if you thought about it, but if you're in an environment, it's easy to just lay on your stomach and push with your feet. And I've seen otters do that, right here in Calvert County, in the snow and on the ice, doing exactly the same thing. I'm going to speed up a little bit because I see I'm taking too much time. These are some chicks. And again, it's just wonderful food all around. <laughs> kind of a wet day. I mean, you can see the smile on their face, can't you? <clears throat> you? can't wait for mom to get home. Now here's a fourth species. This is the macaroni. And that's because of the macaroni that they have up here. That it's not truly macaroni, but they call them that. And they're kind of cool penguins as well. And if you say that penguins can't fly, these are macaronis that have been thrown out of the water in a wave, looking at flying through the air. It's amazing. Looks like they're having fun. The most beautiful penguin in the world, in my opinion, this is the king penguin. A lot of people think, oh, this has got to be, what's that other penguin that everybody thinks about? The emperor. The emperor. I think these are more beautiful than the emperor penguin. And they're much more common than the emperor penguin, too. So this is an adult. <coughs> This is its tongue to help it capture prey. I mean, once prey gets in there because of the shape of that tongue and the way that these little projections are, you can see how difficult it would be for that prey to get away. And here's one sitting on the nest and scratching its head at the same time. Very multitasking. <laughs> very colorful, very entertaining. And this is what their young look like. Very, very different. When scientists first discovered these animals, they thought this was a, a totally different species. They didn't realize it was the young of the king penguin. And these are referred to as the oakum boys. If you're familiar with oakum, it's used in shipbuilding that you put in between the planks to help make it waterproof. It looks very much like oakum. So that's how they got the name, the oakum boys. Here you can see the wind blowing up against them. They have much longer individual feathers. And they tend to get together in what's known as a crèche, where they all get together for protection. And they're, again, like most penguins, they're great swimmers. This is the emperor right there. And this is the penguin that you will not likely see if you go to the Antarctic Peninsula. There's very few emperors there. If you want to see the emperor, You've got to go on special expeditions that even are more expensive and more costly because you have to get further into the interior of the continent. This is a skua. This is another uh, scavenging bird, a beautiful bird. Not in focus, but their beak is the perfect shape to pick up an egg. So this is an egg from a chin strap that it's stolen off of the nest. It's flying away. And there it is right there. And then it will eat that, that egg. And here you can see a skua diving down, and all the adults are looking up, and they're all screaming and hollering, and putting out the alert to let everybody else know that this bird is trying to come in and attack our colony. 
And this is an example of some of the colonies. Uh, imagine penguins marching up to these heights to build their nests. And also notice the color. That's all regurgitated crew. And then sometimes you just have these beautiful scenes. This is uh, one of my favorite places called Half Moon Island. Beautiful, majestic mountains in the background. Great, beautiful mountains. Icebergs. Occasionally you'll have an area that's relatively snow and ice free. This is called Cooperville. So this is a place where a lot of people go and do hikes up to the top of the mountain and whatnot. And this is a panoramic. This is inside a volcanic uh, crater. This is called Deception Island. You can see our vessel there, give you an idea. And this is where you come into the middle of the caldera. It's the only place in the world that I know of where you can come in to a nearly intact volcanic crater called Deception Island. This is also the place where a lot of people do swimming because the water is relatively warm. By relative, I mean maybe five degrees instead of one degree, something like that. Uh, this is Elephant Island. This is where Shackleton and his men had to stay for all of those days waiting for rescue. So imagine what it was like to live in an area like that. And then you just get beautiful areas. This is called uh, Paradise Bay. And then this is what an expedition would be like where you go ashore, go hiking up on top of a snow ridge or something like that just for the view. Uh, here's an example of the same place looking down. Beautiful vistas. Uh, it's typical when you do a continental landing that you do a body slide on the snow. And so people that can will hike all the way up here and then you'll slide down either on your stomach or on your back all the way back down as a way to celebrate that you've done your continental landing in Antarctica. This is Peter and Island, one of my favorite places to go visit. Great mountains. This is uh, some of the icebergs that you will see. These are known as uh, tabular icebergs because they look very flat, but they haven't eroded much. But you can get tabular icebergs. We, were, we saw one last year that was over eight miles long and two miles wide. So that's a big, huge chunk of ice that broke off from the glacier. And over time, it will continue to break up and get into smaller and smaller pieces. kind of the snow blowing around on the top. <clears throat> and here's an example of an iceberg where you all know that when you get icicles, they're going to be perpendicular to the ground. Right? Well, here's an iceberg that's lost its stability. It's moved upward. So now the, ice, the icicle's coming off at an angle, and a new icicle is beginning to form on the very tip of it. So you can kind of see the geological history of what's happening there. There's also history. Don't have time to go into it, but this is a British base that was established during World War II on one of the islands. It's been abandoned now. This is a grave of one of the whalers that died in the same area. And then if you ever go to Antarctica, I would highly encourage you to also consider going to South Georgia. A lot of people probably have never heard of South Georgia. It's a sub-Antarctic island. It takes an extra two days, beyond the two days that it takes to get to Antarctica, to get to South Georgia, but it's worth it. For me, South Georgia is five times more beautiful and interesting than Antarctica. And every time I go to Antarctica, I want to try to go on a trip that includes South Georgia. And this is an example of South Georgia. It's sub-Antarctic, so it means that you have some green, that you don't typically have in Antarctica, and you also have more animal life. These are, this is a king penguin colony right there. And you are right there looking at around 150,000 king penguins in one view shed. This is what the beach looks like. <clears throat> These are elephant seals. These are all penguins that are coming ashore, going back to their nesting area. This is a river running through the colony. And here are all of the uh, oakum boys. Here are the adults. If you want to see something like this, this is like National Geographic when it's real. And this is South Georgia. 
So I would encourage you to do that. You also get glaciers, you also get mountains, just like you get in Antarctica. Here's a crush. Here's a spring tail, that stiff tail, detail of what the foot looks like, very much like a dinosaur. You know, birds are living dinosaurs. <laughs> and just like in Antarctica, if you be still, the animals will come up to you. So here you can see these canes that are very curious to begin with that have come up to check out these passengers. Is it very noisy there? Very noisy and smelly. <laughs> But it's worth every day. So this is where you would typically meet, the southern tip of South America. There's the Antarctic Peninsula. And you can see that that gap right there, that's a two-day gap to get from that point to that point. And where is South Georgia? South Georgia is right there. So let me show you. This is the Falklands. Some of the trips leave from Ushuaia, which is in Argentina. They go to the Falklands. They go to South Georgia. And then they'll go to the Antarctic Peninsula. It just depends on what trip you want. And if anybody's interested in doing any of these trips, I'm more than happy to talk to you about it. There's pros and cons depending on what you want to do. But this is the typical Antarctic trip. Two days across, usually three to five days down here, and then two days back. If you want to do this trip, it's usually a day to get to the Falklands, two days to get to South Georgia, two days to get back to Antarctica, and then two days from Antarctica to get back to South America. A lot of sea days, but it's really worth the trip. And you have a diversity of kinds of vessels that you can use. If you want to go on the cheap with family-style uh, meals, you can go on one of the old Russian vessels. You're going to have a rocky road. Food's not going to be very good, but it's going to be relatively cheap. Or you can go in a mid-class type of a vessel. This is called the Minerva or the Explorer II. I've been on all of these vessels. If you want to go up in standard, this is the A and K vessel. This is known as the Boreal. And then if you want to go ultimate, upper class, six star ship, this is Seaborn Quest. And let me tell you, the food on board that ship is outstanding. And so that's the end. <laughs>
And so what it does, it creates little cavities, and you can have underwater courses of fresh water that are running under the glaciers that happen to help to lubricate the bottom and cause the glaciers to move faster. But under the continental surface? Under the continental surface, okay. moving down into the ocean. Yeah. And there's also freshwater lakes that have been discovered. And there's big controversies. When you, you find a lake, do you want to drill down into it? And if you do, are we going to contaminate that water? Is there life in that lake down there that we don't know of? How are we going to... What are the pros and cons of all this? In Russia, you may have heard about just a couple of years ago, penetrated into the largest freshwater lake that's known to exist in Antarctica against the will of most of the other scientific community. But they went ahead and did it. No one knows what the consequences of that have been. But that's, that's another good question. Any other? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, you just mentioned the water getting under the glacier. There was just a big article in the Post, that I don't know if you saw it, about the Tahiti Glacier, and that that's what's happening, and it's melting way faster than they ever thought. Yeah, it's, there's so much that we still don't know about the world that we live in. But one of the things that's very interesting to me is that they're beginning to discover under ice volcanoes. And those under ice volcanoes, which are known as inglacial, are putting out so much heat that they're causing these freshwater lakes to form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then where does that water go? Well, it begins to seek out through cracks, cracks, <laughs> and areas along the, 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 the bottom of the ice. And so you're getting movement of fresh water flowing as well as the glacier itself being lubricated by that. So it's a very complex world that we live in, and we still don't fully understand it. Yes, sir. And you said that the uh, South Pole moves over time. The ice moves over the South Pole. The South Pole, the geographic South Pole does not move. The well, that was my question, because that's sort of geometrically determined. Yes. That's the axis of your return. But the magnetic South Pole does move. Well, so yeah, there's, there's different, you have the geographic South Pole, that's fixed. But the ice is moving over it, so that means that the station is not now located directly over the geographic south pole. It's now off to the side of it. But you also have the, ge the magnetic south pole, which is moving constantly. And just as the north magnetic pole is moving constantly. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Who's studying down there besides the Americans and the Russians? It's amazing. There's many, many countries that have research stations down there. Belgium, Germany, Japan, China, uh, Chile, Argentina. I can't even begin to tell you all of them. Why are they all down there? Some of them are down there for honest scientific work. Most of them are down there for political purposes. Uh, Argentina and Chile, they fight with each other all the time as to, they believe that they own certain wedges of the pie, so to speak. Why does the United States maintain a station at the South Pole? At the magnetic South Pole. It's a political statement. Because every time a plane lands, they attempt to do a circle around that. It's kind of a way of saying, yeah, you know, if we ever had to, we could claim that the entire continent belongs to us. We've had a station right here at the South Pole. Uh, England has stations in many, many places. What I will say is that most of the countries are down there because they're really trying to do science. But there are countries that are down there mainly to make a political statement. And that is because they think that there's the potential for future uh, economic uh, endeavors through mining and that kind of stuff. It's, it's, what I would like to end on a happy note is that most people regard Antarctica as a world park. It doesn't belong to any country. It doesn't belong to any individual. And if we all cooperate together, we can maintain this park and its natural environmental and cultural heritage for future generations. So that's why people are trying to fight to not allow pirate whaling to come in and not allow mining engineers to come in and prospect for gold and platinum and diamonds and all this kind of stuff that all exists in Antarctica. The thing that you've got going for Antarctica is that because it has so much ice and because it's so difficult to get there, it's not economically viable to drill for oil and to drill for gold and all that.
that kind of stuff. That doesn't mean that that couldn't happen in the future. It could. But if the world can hold together this concept of a world park that belongs to no one and will be preserved for everyone, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Only time will tell. I think what I'll do is I'll cut it off, and if you have other questions, I'll be around. But thank you all. You've been a really great audience. Hope to see you